So where's NASA headed? Uh, my concern about NASA is everyone keeps thinking that they need a destination for everyone to rally around, as was the moon. But I claim that total access to space is what matters here. We should not think of it as a destination one-off project. The moon was a one-off project. We succeeded in going. The cat caught the bus after it was chasing it, and then what does the cat do with the bus at that point? There's no other plan in place. So if you develop a suite of launch vehicles, for example, that are tuned or can be have strap-on boosters to go to one destination or another, depending on your need, then you can serve all of those interests, and all the while you will innovate. You will innovate in ways that can transform life on Earth. Now, I'll give an example, a really simple example. If you go to uh, uh, cities where it rains with some frequency, and there's a turn on a highway exit, and you look at the road surface at that turn, it's actually grooved. It's grooved. Well, that improves traction on a turn, so you don't fly off the side. So that's a simple thing to put in. I wonder who came up with that, because long ago they were not there. It turns out it was NASA. NASA wanted to assure that this glider coming in for a landing called the space shuttle, which has no propulsion of its own, would not skid in ways unpredicted on that runway. So they did the research and found you just groove the pavement, it works for you. And you can say, well, you didn't need to spend $18 billion a year on a NASA budget to find that. Apparently we did, because no one else came up with it. That, and that's my point. Your, your motivation, I could say, make this curve safer. And people come up with different guardrails and collision absorbers, but no one came up with, with, with grooves. But I really care about space shuttle. I care about space. I care about NASA. So if I'm tasked with making the space shuttle safe, I'm differently motivated than just trying to protect your Prius coming off the exit. And it's how differently motivated you are when you have huge projects that attract the best and the brightest in any community. And they come up with solutions, even those that are simple. So NASA, need, I think they need to think of all of space. And the country needs to recognize that that becomes an insurance policy against the failure of our 21st century economy. And if that doesn't happen, we might as well just move back into the cave. Uh, space, been there, done that. It's time to explore other frontiers. So, at, in particular, medicine. And so, allow me to shed some light on that. If you walk into a hospital, a nice, large, busy hospital, and open up every door of every um, diagnostic lab, you'll see machines with on-off switches that are brought to bear in the service of diagnosing the condition of the human body without cutting you open. There's no end of such machines in the hospital, from x-rays, the whole radiology department, uh, MRIs, the uh, PET scans, all of this. Every single machine that a medical doctor uses that has an on-off switch is based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine at the time of the discovery. That's my whole point of the A, B, C, D. That is the economic driver. It's just not the Band-Aid economic driver, it's a deep cultural economic driver that requires the big mission, everyone participates, it gets blogged about, journalists write about it, artists are influenced by it, they tell stories, they fictionalize space accounts, and then it becomes, car design starts getting influenced by some new spaceship that gets launched, and it becomes in our culture, and when it's in your culture, people do it without even having to be told to do so. So, yes. Or, I, 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 I fantasize about this, going to China, going to the head of China, and I say, Psst. I need you to leak a memo that says you want to put military bases on Mars, okay? <laughs> Doesn't have to be true, just leak it. And then I run back to the United States, oh, look what we found. If we found that memo, we'd be on Mars in 10 months with astronauts. What, one month to fund, design, and build the spacecraft, and nine months to get there. I have no doubt that our military resolve won't do exactly what it needs to do to stay ahead of that. But, uh, like I said, I'd rather it not be militaristically driven. The economic as a capitalist democracy, economic drivers ought to be enough. It's been enough to do so much in the world before. So that's the, that's the explanation. 
It just doesn't fit in a single newspaper headline. But you can't sound by A going to D. You can sound by A going to B. More science teachers. That works for a sound bite and a band-aid. First of all, a Virgin Galactic, last I looked, I think it's a suborbital loop. But even if it does go orbital, which won't be for a really long time, if that's their actual first goal, uh, if you're going to send me into space and risk my life, I will do so only if I have a destination lined up. Like I said, I don't want to just boldly go where hundreds have gone before. I would welcome the zero-G experience, but you can do that on the Vomit Comet, you know, the plane that does the parabolic loops without risking uh, exiting the atmosphere to do so. People like going up above the atmosphere and you can see stars at night. Well, well, stars with the sun in the sky. I can wait till the sun sets to see stars on Earth, right? I'm cool with that. As an astrophysicist, I do that all the time. Uh, I think the, at $200,000 a ticket, I'm not lining up first. It doesn't offer me the return on my investment that I would seek. I walk in and I say, who wants to be an aerospace engineer? Because we want to design the first airfoil to navigate the rarefied air of Mars. I win. Who wants to be a biologist to discover the next cure for cancer? Noble cause, for sure. I walk in. Who wants to be a biologist because we're looking for alien life in the soils of Mars? I win again. I will win every single head-to-head -head exchange in front of a class of eighth graders. Because, and I used to think I was biased. I'm not biased. I'm not. Who wants to be a biologist and go search the liquid oceans of Jupiter's moon Europa to see if alien life swims up to the camera lens? I win again. Okay? So, so, okay. Who? And by the way, I'm not faking the appeal for, for the adversarial side here. Who wants to study the undersea ocean, go to the Marianas Trench, deep down, and try to find what might lurk there? Cool. Now, who wants to go to the bottom of Europa's ocean on Mars? I mean, uh, outside of Jupiter. I win there. Who wants to study uh, uh, Mount Etna, which may explode volcanically in the next 10 years? Maybe be able to predict its, its explosion. Okay. Who wants to come with me to Jupiter's moon Io, which has the most violent volcano in the solar system, spewing so much magma, it repays the entire moon every 10 years? I win again. So my point is, if I want to attract people to STEM fields, the existence of these projects is its own force of nature. Otherwise, you have to stand there and tell them what your needs are and hope that they care enough about your needs to come to you and solve the problems with the resources you are allocating because you think the resources you're allocating are what's going to actually solve the problem. When some of the greatest solutions to problems came about from some other place because not every creative person is in your field. I'll give another example. Let's say you're an expert in thermodynamics the formation and transfer of heat. You're an expert. And I say, here's a billion dollars. Invent me a better stove than this one that Ben Franklin is using. And you have unlimited money. So you say, you'll make it more insulated. You might put temperature probes. You'll put timers. You'll recycle the heat. You'll, you'll come up with an awesome oven. You'll invent a, the convection oven, the surround oven, you would have never invented the microwave oven. Because that comes from communications research in the production of microwaves. It doesn't come from your lab of thermodynamics. That's why all those fields need to be funded. And you could do that for free, sort of, by making space that frontier. Medicine is not the future without the machines they use. Now, how about neuroscience? I love me some neuroscience. I think neuroscience is to psychology what chemistry is to alchemy. Psychologists hate it when I say that. 
I think the day will come where our entire understanding of the mind will come about through the efforts of neuroscience. Go ahead. By the way, neuroscience is much cheaper than exploring space. Uh, so there's no reason why that shouldn't have all the money it could ever possibly want if we're getting money for space. But to say, how about neuroscience? Uh, I don't know that neuroscience is going to affect large industry. Look at what space affects. Telecommunications, mining, uh, all these frontiers of science, geology, atmospherics. I don't yet know of a way neuroscience will affect atmospherics. So, yes, it's a perfectly beautiful, burgeoning, blossoming field. But to say space or neuroscience, that's not even the right conversation to have. In a free society, someone ought to be able to do what they want. Look at the number of technologies that have to come together to make the iPhone. We have freaking satellites tracking where you are on Earth, telling you when to make a left turn. If you were tasked with only making a better telephone, would you have come up with that? I don't think so. So, no, I don't walk around. I say space because it's all these fields, not space because it's astrophysics. I am excited by every frontier on which we are profoundly ignorant. I'm excited by the neuroscience frontier. I'm excited that we don't know what dark matter is, or dark energy, or how life arose from, from non-animate, from inanimate organic molecules. I'm, I'm excited by not knowing what was around before the Big Bang. I'm excited by wondering whether all our knowledge can be summed into one equation, as the string theorists seek. I'm excited to wonder whether there is life thriving in the oceans of Europa. Uh, I think not enough people are excited by ignorance. I think most people fear ignorance. They have to have an answer. This shows up in UFO reports. They see a light dancing in the sky. They don't know what it is. They call it a UFO, because that's what the U stands for, unidentified. They say, I don't know what it is. It must be an intelligent alien visiting from outer space. No, you just said you don't know what it is. If you don't know what it is, it then must not be anything. Just live in the ignorance that something cool was happening. Await better data. The people that have to have an answer, they don't work on the frontier because they create answers that keep them emotionally satisfied. And by the way, the universe doesn't care rat behind about your emotions. There's no end of people who assert the universe must be some way. And that bias influenced their, their data taking, their interpretation. These are scientists that were ultimately shown to be um, not worthy of following their results. So I'm excited by all of that. And I like being alive at the time discoveries were made. Uh, I would have liked to have been alive in the 1920s, uh, except for the part that people of my skin color weren't treated nicely back then. But holding that aside, I would like to have witnessed and been around and read the newspaper articles of Edwin Hubble discovering that we are just one of uncountable number of galaxies in the universe. To read the news, this happened in the 1920s, to read that the universe was in fact expanding. Expanding into what? That's a whole new question no one even knew to ask. Now that you know it's expanding, what's it expanding into? If it's expanding today, it meant it was smaller yesterday. How small did it once, did it, was it, has it ever been? Whole new sets of questions rise up. And in the 1920s, we discovered quantum physics. This obscure field where you study the behavior of the atom and the nucleus. Weird stuff scientists, physicists are doing on their tabletop. Why fund that? Sixty years later, it would be the entire foundation of our information technology revolution. There is no IT without a mastery of quantum physics. By some estimates, it's one-third of the entire value of the world's economy is traceable to information technology, the creation, storage, and retrieval of information, enabled 
by quantum physics discovered in the 1920s. I would have loved to have witnessed the unfolding of those discoveries. And perhaps we are on the doorstep of another set of discoveries, some of which may explain other questions that left unanswered. Those are the best kind. 